in collaboration with BrainMind, let's review the importance of sleep for optimal brain health. There has been an explosion of evidence in the last few years about the relationship of sleep, and not just the total amount of sleep, but the individual aspects of sleep quality and its impact on brain health. Some of us may follow or try to track a little bit how we sleep. Time we go to bed, what time we wake up, and maybe we shoot for seven hours, seven and a half, maybe ideally eight. But in reality, what really happens? What we've learned is that when we track people's sleep, even though people say they're sleeping seven or eight hours, they're actually sleeping six to seven. When people tell me that they're sleeping six to seven, they're usually sleeping much less than that. There is no way that the body can regenerate and the brain can refresh itself without optimal sleep. People that burn the candle at both ends have higher stress levels, cortisol levels, and brain aging. Yep, impaired brain function is related to accelerated brain aging. A lack of sleep and a lack of restful sleep is critical. Let's talk about the stages of sleep. When someone initially tries to fall asleep, they may slowly but steadily delve into what is called light sleep. Light sleep is not restorative in any way, but it's a precursor to the essential phases of sleep to come later. Let's talk about deep sleep, otherwise known as slow wave sleep, and REM sleep, otherwise known as rapid eye movement sleep. REM sleep is the dream phase of sleep. That's what most commonly people know it as. But as a cognitive neuroscientist, when I think of REM sleep, that's when I think of memory consolidation. In an effort to have a person's brain function at peak performance and have memories go from short-term to long-term, it's imperative for a person to get adequate amounts of REM sleep. Further, let's talk about deep sleep. In the past, I don't know that we were exactly sure what deep sleep did. We thought it was for restoration and we thought it was for rejuvenation. But what we now know when it comes to brain science is that that's when the trash gets taken out in terms of amyloid accumulation. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Say someone is living a great lifestyle. They're exercising on a regular basis, which in colloquial terms, loosens up the amyloid. Guess what? Without adequate amounts of deep sleep, that loosened up amyloid still stays in the brain. Deep sleep uses a type of drainage called the glymphatic system. We may have heard about the bloodstream, of course, and how the blood tracks all throughout the body. We may have talked about the lymphatic system, where someone may have an infection and the white blood cells get cleared out in an effort to fight that infection. But most people haven't heard about this new system called the glymphatic system, which is basically the way that the irrigation of the brain takes place. So when someone has adequate restorative sleep, in addition to adequate lifestyle changes, the conjunction of both is necessary for optimal brain performance and to reduce risk of brain aging over time. One of the most important things that I talk to my patients about is sleep tracking. Truly getting a sense of how many hours a person is sleeping is important, but using very specific wearables, a wrist biosensor, a ring, a variety of other devices, we can get a much more objective rather than a subjective tracking sense of our sleep. There are a variety of lifestyle changes that we can make to try to optimize deep sleep and optimize REM sleep. Honestly, we should all shoot for a total of at least seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. While sleep need is a highly individual process, in our research, when people actually slept for less than around seven hours and 11 minutes on average, easy to remember, 7-11, those people had poorer cognitive function the next day. So, if we're satisfied with five, five and a half, six or six and a half hours, we have to realize we're burning the candle at both ends and we're having a negative impact on brain health. The other aspect about sleep is Let's say we're shooting for eight hours of total sleep. How many hours should we be shooting for deep sleep and REM sleep? The numbers vary quite a bit, but I would say anywhere between 20 to 22, even to 25% of your total sleep should comprise of REM and also should comprise of deep sleep. These numbers, again, are a little bit uh, unclear because different people may need different specific amounts, 
but at least an hour and 15, an hour and a half at least of REM sleep and an hour and a half of deep sleep per night are probably what is necessary to maintain a healthy brain and to reduce risk for Alzheimer's disease. The other key components of sleep, not just the stages and not the total amounts of sleep, but how long it takes someone to fall asleep. Insomnia is very important to address. For example, why is the person having trouble falling asleep? Are they ruminating? Talked about how rumination and chronic negative thoughts can actually impair cognitive function and lead to a progression of Alzheimer's disease pathology. But there are several reasons that people may have trouble falling asleep. And the interventions that we suggest include cognitive behavioral therapy, also potentially a supplement like melatonin, and then there are also drugs that can help get people to sleep better. In an ideal world, we should try to avoid the drugs when possible and use non-pharmacological approaches as top priority. Also, it's important to prioritize sleep, but prioritize and make a plan for sleep hygiene. Try to go to bed the same time every day and wake up at the same time every morning. Try to also not eat too close to bedtime, because what we found is that the more people eat closer to bedtime, those sleep stages don't end up being in the targets that we would like for optimal brain health. Also, using the bed and the bedroom for sleep. The bedroom should be a calm place for sleep. You can read in bed and you can maybe watch TV, but you should track to see the impact of these pre-sleep activities on your own sleep hygiene. And that's where using a wearable or a sleep tracker can really come in handy. I have patients that say, I just can't get comfortable in bed. Figure out why. Is it the bed quality? Do you need a different mattress? Do you need a different pillow? What about a different temperature? Some people have trouble falling asleep and their partners may have different temperature requirements. Well, there's now pads that people can insert in their mattress to change the temperature on one side versus another side of the bed. What about that little crack of light that comes in through the window? Well, close the curtains, put some black tape, do whatever you can to minimize distractions because this synergistic effect of all of these little modifications can enhance our sleep and lead to better brain health outcomes. So, to summarize, sleep is one of the most critical aspects of brain health. Burning the candle at both ends doesn't work when it comes to rejuvenating the brain and taking the trash out, so to speak, with amyloid protein. As we know, certain people can accumulate amyloid in the brain. And as we also know, the only time when we can effectively minimize or dispose of the amyloid in the brain is during a specific stage of sleep. So, make sleep a priority. Pay attention, and when in doubt, talk to someone. Talk to a healthcare provider or a psychologist, a sleep psychologist, for example, to try to help you make a better plan for sleep.